This is Dr. Andre Panosian. I am a board certified plastic surgeon practicing in Beverly Hills, and I am also a facial paralysis specialist. And I'd like to talk to you guys about facial paralysis today. So we will get going and we will answer some questions at the end. Approximately 30 to 40 minutes of presentation will be followed by uh, another 10 to 20 minutes or longer, if you need be, of question answer uh, period. So Without further ado, we will continue on. So what is facial paralysis? Uh, facial paralysis is damage sustained to the facial nerve. It is also known as uh, the cranial nerve 7. Partial versus total are the descriptions that it can be used, whether it is a complete paralysis versus a weakness. It can be either one side or both. Or it could it be acute versus chronic? So there's a lot of different ways to characterize this. And of course, there could be the congenital variants, which are slightly different than the acquired uh, variants. And we'll go over that in, in detail as well. So wh what is the facial nerve? It's the, also known as the cranial nerve seven. There's a total of 12 cranial nerves present. The cranial nerve number seven is responsible for animating the face. It, it supplies the uh, muscles of the face that are responsible for our expressions and some other key functions. Um, it originates in the brainstem, as you can see over here. This is where it sits, right next to number six. And so from there, it sprouts and goes through the skull right behind the ear at a point called the stylomastoid foramen. And as it comes out, it branches heavily uh, just in front of the ear and passes into all of the different musculature of the face. Now, the muscles of facial expression, there's about 20 of them, and as I said, they're all innervated by the seventh cranial nerve, or also known as the facial nerve. The key functions include eye closure, lip closure, speech swallowing, and of course, the most noticeable problem is the smile. Now, there's various causes of facial paralysis, and we see our friend Lyle Lovett here demonstrating a little bit of a mild palsy there, but uh, Bell's palsy is by and large the uh, most frequent reason for people to have facial paralysis. Other reasons can include uh, trauma, stroke, tumor, uh, whether it's a tumor resection or a brain tumor that's compressing the nerve, uh, and it can be congenital. In other words, it can, the kids can uh, have this from birth, whether it is from a birth injury or from the fact that the nerve body never developed in the brain stem. So some of the problems that we see with facial paralysis include the following. We can see that in this very clearly in these pictures, there could be a brow droop, as you can see here, uh, eyelid droop as well, and you can sort of see it as well as a bigger eye uh, presence. When they close the eye, that's when the problem really manifests itself very clearly. Uh, the facial droop can exist as well, although it's not very pronounced in this particular child. Um, and uh, the facial asymmetry also is present. Smile, of course, is the most, most noticeable thing that is affected, and it's a very dynamic uh, part of facial paralysis that we see. Uh, now, moving forward, this is uh, our good friend Yellow Man, a, a reggae singer from Jamaica who is demonstrating a, a, for a very severe type of facial paralysis, and of course, there are numerous problems related to this type of paralysis. One is that the, there's failure to protect the eye. The speech is also uh, affected as well as you can imagine. And there's drooling because of the failure of the muscles of the lips to close and keep spit in. Swallowing can also be a problem. But the muscles of the face are also responsible for propelling uh, a bolus of food from the mouth back in towards the uh, back of the tongue and the throat region where the throat muscles will then take over. And with the drooling, and difficulty in closing the mouth come dental problems. Dental caries or cavities can develop, which can result in tooth loss and significant uh, problems there. And of course, the most noticeable uh, and most uh, compelling problem is the psychosocial issues that surround facial paralysis. And these are the main problems that we see most commonly. So facial paralysis can be divided into early or late interventions. So what does early mean? So early is typically considered less than 12 months. And uh, there's a really important distinction to be made here. Uh, right around 
12 to 18 months, the nerves that input into muscles start to permanently die off. And once that happens, there's no recovering that innervation. So before 12 months, we can more reliably perform re procedures such as nerve transfers, which I will touch on later. Now, if you miss that window, you're considered a late uh, candidate for facial reanimation, and the uh, period of time is, ex uh, is uh, expected to be more than 12 months from the time of the initial paralysis or injury. So this results, as I mentioned, in permanent denervation or lack of innervation to the muscles of the face, and muscle and or nerve transfers can sometimes be combined. The nerve transfers only can be combined in the setting of a partial paralysis or a weakness that can exist. So to wait or not to wait, this is a controversial uh, topic. Uh, it is classic teaching to wait, to give it a period of observation for nerves to recover on their own. The endpoint, however, is usually uncertain and, the, and patients are usually given the advice to simply wait, not really how long to wait, but just to simply wait, which brings up the topic, well, when do you come in to intervene or change the course of that uh, innervation process to a favorable outcome. The, the answer to that is really you need to follow the trend. And that really translates into seeing a facial paralysis surgeon specifically early in the treatment of facial palsy. So in other words, when the moment that you see that there is a, a trend towards a facial paralysis or something is happening there, then you need to seek out a facial pro, uh, paralysis surgeon specifically. Now, diagnostic studies can be done. Uh, brain MRIs are useful in the setting of, uh, of picking up a facial nerve paralysis, uh, specifically related to tumors of the brain. <clears throat> it can also determine uh, the presence of strokes and things like that, of that nature. Uh, nerve conduction studies can also be performed, but these are somewhat uh, uh, difficult to justify because of the process that is involved in placing needles in the face and to gain uh, uh, really valuable information related to facial nerve conduction. Same thing with electromyography, which is to see what the status of the muscles are in the face, separate from nerve studies. So all of this really doesn't mean anything if there's no meaningful facial movement or adequate symmetry. It doesn't matter if you have a small amount of weakness or complete paralysis. If that side of the face is not adequately moving, then you are potentially a candidate for facial paralysis reconstruction or facial reanimation. So the only the periodic uh, physical exams are the most valuable. In other words, to uh, to really set to set the uh, uh, evaluation process down to determine when something is early and not progressing versus late and permanent. So the special case we'll talk about is the congenital case. So what does that mean? Congenital means that uh, children are born with the facial paralysis, and there are certain recognized conditions that are related to this. Uh, many times this involves lack of formation of the facial nerve nucleus, which, uh, as we showed in the previous graphic, exists in the brainstem, or the branches thereof can fail to develop. So things like Mobius syndrome uh, is the most common cause of congenital bilateral facial paralysis. Uh, meaning both sides of the face are affected. Uh, hemifacial microstomia can also present in approximately 20% of cases with facial nerve palsy. And I use facial paralysis and facial nerve palsy interchangeably as they mean the same thing. Um, uh, many times in fa hemifacial microstomia, you may still have some innervation of the face, and that can uh, be either favorable or unfavorable and result in the need for further surgery. Uh, there are also other craniofacial syndromes that can have facial paralysis as a component. There's usually no potential for nerve regeneration beyond what is present. And the reason, again, is that the nerve body or the nerve nucleus never fail to develop or the branches never fail to develop. So there's strengthening of what is potentially there, but to regenerate a nerve uh, that is completely paralyzed is not an option in congenital palsy which leaves us with surgery as our only option. So treatment, when we think about treatment, now that we've diagnosed facial paralysis, we want to start figuring out what is the best treatment. 
we always start off simple. We start off with observation. Again, as I mentioned, we need to have a period of observation to see if the facial nerve palsy reverses on its own. So in the setting of Bell's palsy, for example, which is essentially a, an idiopathic or an unknown reason for why people develop facial nerve paralysis, um, we give that, those patients a period of observation in order to see if there is improvement. Sometimes we put in, uh, we add in steroids or antiviral medications to help with that uh, process, but uh, many times um, the Bell's palsy will reverse on its own without much intervention. But again, the, the key here is to monitor patients from the get-go. It's very important to know if there's a stalling of improvement or if there's no improvement. And in my practice, I like to look at patients approximately every month and decide every three months whether there has been improvement. And of course, this is done photographically and uh, videographically to make sure that we are truly seeing no improvement. So again, we can divide treatment options into early options versus late options. Let's say a patient is in the early period and has failed to progress in uh, the uh, uh, reintervation process, for example, with Bell's palsy. Well, in that event, you can proceed with several types of nerve transfers that have been described in the past masseter to facial nerve, basically describing the masseter nerve, which is a, uh, a nerve used for biting, and it is plugged into the trunk of the facial nerve in order to give it a new source of innervation, one that is actually quite strong and a very good transfer to, to do. As a backup, we use the tongue muscle or tongue muscle nerve, which is called the hypoglossal nerve, uh, and we can sometimes plug that into the facial nerve trunk as well, and uh, sometimes we can even bring a nerve across the face from the normal side and splice it in uh, to the paralyzed side in order to give innervation back to that, uh, to the uh, failing facial nerve. And we'll discuss that in a little bit more detail. Uh, muscle transfers are more reserved for later uh, types of uh, uh, facial paralysis. Specifically, we're talking uh, the gracilis and temporalis muscles as the uh, main options involved, gracilis being a muscle in the thigh that is taken, and temporalis being a binding muscle that exists natively on the side of the skull or the temple region. And we sometimes will combine this with static slings. Uh, some folks like to use uh, static slings historically for uh, the corner of the lip to reverse the facial droop. Uh, a piece of tissue, uh, of a piece of tough tissue from the thigh can be taken and anchored to the uh, corner of the mouth and hoist it up, uh, and that is where the, the lips will sit. Whether there's uh, smiling or no smiling, the position of that uh, corner of the lip will not change. Uh, that is called a static option. Uh, eyelid surgery can be uh, uh, also done to improve uh, a lagging of the lower eyelid and a, a difficulty in obtaining complete eye closure. This is a really problematic area and a very good reason why we do these types of surgeries is to, in, set, in essence, um, load the upper eyelid with something, in this, uh, in this case a gold weight or a platinum weight, and we need to do something to the lower eyelid to help it rise up as well. So uh, moving on to nerve transfers, we just touch on the masseter to facial nerve transfer because this is the most common type uh, used in the most analogous way uh, to reconstruct the facial nerve uh, using the biting uh, function. So the masseter is responsible for biting, for triggering the bite muscles. And to some degree, we all bite to trigger a smile or when we're smiling. Uh, the reason why this works is that the masseter nerve sits right in the area uh, deep inside the face next to the jawbone and it supplies the masseter muscle, which is used to close the jaw forcefully, and everyone can feel this on the corner of their jaw when they clench down, uh, and you can feel that for yourself. That is the nerve that we use. Now, we can use that nerve and spare the, the dual inner, duly innervated nerve because we will not be damaging the innervation to that muscle. There's, in other words, there's a second input to that muscle which will allow the muscle to function normally while giving us this very powerful innervation tool to help power our uh, 
uh, facial nerve, which has been uh, uh, paralyzed at this point. Now, again, early, we're talking about early because the facial nerve is still making contact with the muscles of, of the face, and that is a very valuable uh, aspect of facial paralysis surgery, and it's a very important point in the evaluation process to, to maintain. Now, when we look at the paralyzed face, I like to divide this into thirds in terms of what is the most important function uh, in, in, when we divide the face into thirds. We can classify the upper third as the forehead region, the middle third, eyes being the most important uh, area in the middle third, and lower, lip, uh, lower third is responsible for the lips and smiling function, which are critical for so many things. So during animation, we see something else happening. So uh, the upper forehead uh, does not elevate, there does not wrinkle as it normally should. The, in the middle third, the eyes uh, are slow to blink and they, some, and they will come to an incomplete closure. The eye rotates upwards. A, a very, it's a protective reflex called the Bell's Phenomenon, which helps protect the cornea from drying out and damage. The lower uh, portion of the, uh, of the face which is responsible for the lips and the smile, uh, basically produces a, a very characteristic droop or lack of a nasal labial fold. The, in, in a dynamic fashion, the, the uh, lips shift towards the normal side forcefully because they are, the muscles are unopposed at this point. And again, there's no lower lip depression here. All of the forces are now pulled towards the normal side of the face, which is even more distorting of the facial features. So when we uh, think of the upper third of the face, we, we think about, well, what can we do to help improve it? When we have a drifting downwards of the brow, what we can do is a, something called a brow lift. So we can uh, elevate the brow through a number of different means. Uh, some of the, these are also used in, some of these techniques are also used in cosmetic surgery uh, to help improve the position of the eyebrow. Uh, uh, to a more aesthetically appealing and symmetric state. Uh, the other option is to perform uh, Botox or selective denervation uh, of the normal side muscle in the forehead, which is called the frontalis muscle. Now we purposely damage the innervation or the muscle itself uh, in order to balance the position of the eyebrows. Now not all patients will demonstrate a dropped eyebrow and therefore that procedure may be a of great help in restoring the balance of the forehead region. Also a reason why many people will have Botox for cosmetic uh, improvements. In the middle third, as we described, eye closure is the biggest problem here. And it's a very dangerous problem because that can result in vision loss. Uh, and, per and this can be permanent. So <clears throat> the upper eyelid we address with uh, many, there's many, first of all, there's many different options available. So the upper eyelid we need to address as well as the lower eyelid. Uh, dynamic muscle options have been described for the eyelid, but the results are, uh, are too variable, uh, in my opinion, to uh, uh, practice in my patient population. In fact, the, the static options are much more predictable and aesthetically more pleasing uh, than what we can do dynamically so far. So the upper eyelid most often will get a platinum weight. It needs to be weighted down somehow in order to achieve closure of the eyes uh, themselves. That can be done also with a spring mechanism or a levator lengthening, which has been described by a uh, prominent craniofacial surgeon uh, back many decades ago named Paul Tessier. And uh, the lower eyelid will then need to be uh, uh, elevated as well. So there's many ways to do this. Sometimes because of the gravity effect on the cheek, the cheek falls and pulls the lower eyelid down with it. Doing something like a mid-face lift, or such as we do in cosmetic surgery, can help increase the uh, position of the eyelid and to elevate the eyelid itself just by simply lifting the cheek up. Uh, sometimes this isn't enough. And, and the, can be hard to justify doing this in a child. So what we often need to do is something a little bit more aggressive than the standard lower eyelid lift that is common in cosmetic surgery, 
And things such as a tarsurophy, where the outer corner of the eye is sewn, can be uh, a variable uh, uh, benefit. More often, in my practice, I will perform a tendon sling to help elevate the lower eyelid more forcefully and more permanently so that the upper eyelid has a chance to uh, achieve closure uh, in a more uh, uh, complete way. So the upper eyelid uh, mechanisms are, are, are the uh, gold weight placement is illustrated as in this picture here, uh, where the uh, an incision through the upper eyelid is made and small weight, which has been predicted uh, preoperatively as far as the amount to place, is then inserted and sewn to the surrounding mechanism of the upper eyelid and the incision is then closed. The spring mechanism, as you can see here, it basically uh, uses the uh, natural rebound effect of the eyelid to allow the eye to come to closure. In, set, in essence, the spring is allowing the uh, little ability of closure of the upper eyelid to maximize uh, by lengthening uh, uh, as well. And of course, is, there is the levator lengthening uh, procedure. So in addressing the lower eyelid, the tendon sling is uh, by four, uh, it, it is my particular surgery of choice. So a tendon is usually taken from some part of the body. In most cases, it's the wrist region through a small incision. Uh, the tendon is then tunneled underneath the eyelid margin itself, and then it's hooked up just above the, later, or the, the outer corner of the eye and also to the inner corner corner of the eye, and it's uh, sewn to itself as well as anchored into the bone uh, to maintain a very tight uh, clothesline type of uh, uh, structure so that it prevents the drifting of the eyelid itself. In the lower third of the face, uh, we're talking about smile asymmetry. In other words, uh, we want to reconstruct the dynamic movement of the lips, especially with regards to smiling. And there are several advantages to, uh, to doing this, and we've touched on this before, but um, the, when reconstructing the smile, it's very important to, uh, <clears throat> to uh, place uh, the muscle properly along the upper uh, lip and corner of the mouth to reconstruct this nasal labial fold and to mimic the movement or the vector of movement of the normal side. Um, and again, we've discussed gracilis muscle as an option and the temporalis muscle as an option. And there's various choices of nerve usage. We can use either the seventh nerve or the fifth nerve most commonly. And those are again, the opposite facial nerve, which we can basically bring across like an extension cord using something called a cross face nerve graph, which I will discuss in a little bit. On the same side, we can use the masseter nerve to help uh, power that uh, muscle from the paralyzed side, assuming that the masseter nerve is still intact. Um, there are other nerves that can be used, such as the hypoglossal nerve and some other historically uh, relevant nerves, but otherwise, these are much less commonly used these days. When we look at a smile, we like to talk about a classification system and, and uh, a uh, very famous plastic surgeon back in the uh, 1970s described his classification system and what he saw that was that if you break everyone down there's really only three major types of smiles and we talk about the very pleasant almost closed lip smile or the Mona Lisa type smile uh, there's also the uh, a slightly more elevated upper lip smile, which activates more of the upper lip uh, mus musculature. And then there's the full tooth smile, where you have all muscles around the lips activated and really producing everything uh, that you see there. And you can see here in our famous uh, uh, figures here that they demonstrate one of each. So the, here here's the, is the good prince showing a full tooth smile. And there, here's uh, the lovely wife demonstrating most closely a uh, type one Rubin style uh, smile or a uh, very pleasant Mona Lisa type smile, although her lips are slightly open. So in the lower third of the face, when we use the gracilis muscle, we will sometimes use it in the single stage 
In other words, one surgery to help reanimate the smile. And we do this by attaching it to the masseter nerve that we described previously. Again, the masseter nerve is responsible for biting, and it's usually not affected in facial paralysis. So we can very frequently use this to power this muscle. Uh, when we have a one-sided paralysis, now again, this is one-sided paralysis only, a two-stage option is possible. What do we mean by that? As we discussed previously, a cross-face nerve graft, where a nerve taken from the leg is then placed into the upper lip and tunneled across to the paralyzed side. It is essentially connected to normal, normal nerve branches of the facial nerve on the unaffected side. And through a period of time, somewhere between six to 12 months, that nerve uh, will make its way down to the uh, end of that nerve banked in the upper lip. That then sets us up for the muscle transfer. The gracilis muscle can then be brought into place and can be connected to that facial nerve specifically, uh, or, the, uh, or the graft specifically, and in essence, you have brought over seventh cranial nerve innervation or facial nerve innervation from the normal side to power the muscle in the paralyzed side. So why do two stages over one stage? Well, the advantages are that you get a spontaneous smile. So in other words, when someone with this type of uh, procedure goes to smile, they will be triggering a smile through the normal seventh cranial nerve channels. And that means that there's no need to retrain that smile. In other words, uh, we do need to retrain a muscle that is innervated by a biting nerve to smile for us because those functions are different. Now the disadvantages are of course that there's two surgeries. You have to undergo two anesthetics. The surgeries can be long. Uh, there's also longer time to animation, in other words, a year or more before you see any movement in the uh, paralyzed side of the face. And there's a general consensus that the muscle power that we place into the uh, paralyzed side is weaker in many individuals. Uh, not all individuals, but weaker uh, in, in, in a lot. So why do one stage then over two stages? Well. As we sort of alluded to, it's actually quicker time to reanimation. In other words, it takes only three months for the muscle to start firing from uh, the moment you do the surgery. And again, it's only one surgery. And the final sort of uh, bonus is that it's a much stronger contraction. And this has been proven uh, before in several studies <coughs> that this is indeed the case, in which case you do have uh, a bigger smile. The disadvantages, again, are that it's non-spontaneous. In other words, a patient who has this done will need to think biting in order to trigger the smile on the paralyzed side. And it requires a prolonged course of therapy and some home exercises to help train that muscle and that nerve to become more spontaneous over time. The good news is that this does seem to happen in the majority of patients. In the lower third of the face, we can also do use the temporalis muscle. Uh, now again, we're, we're using a muscle that is dedicated for biting and repurposing it for smiling. And it was uh, a, a uh, uh, surgery that was proposed back in the 1940s and was sort of not popularized until more recently uh, by a gentleman named Daniel LeBay in France, uh, where the muscle uh, mo mobilization technique was refined and improved. And again, it's, it's a single stage operation. In other words, there's only one surgery required in most patients to, to reanimate the smile. As I said before, it's one of four biting muscles. In other words, there are several other muscles here. In, in this case, the masseter is shown here uh, that are part of the biting musculature. So, and as I mentioned, it's innervated by the fifth cranial nerve or the, or, or the nerve that results in biting. Orthograde meaning that it's, it's driven right through in its natural pathway and it pulls in its natural direction as opposed to previous iterations of this surgery where the muscle was just simply flipped over the arch of the bone here and delivered towards the mouth with very uh, unpleasing results. So side by side, uh, why do one over the other? Well, this is what it looks like. The temporalis is only one surgery. Uh, the gracilis require, can be only one surgery or it can be two surgeries depending on whether a cross-face nerve graft is used. 
is, is the smile spontaneous? As I mentioned, no, the temporalis is not spontaneous because you, again, are using the biting nerve. And the gracilis can be spontaneous if you do use the cross-face nerve graft option. And again, that is only available in the one-sided paralysis case. When we think about cosmetics of the procedure, we want to know what it looks like, whether at rest or when activated. And do we see additional cheek bulk? Well, in the temporalis, we do not see that because this is driven through the uh, normal pathway and, and facial architecture, uh, whereas the gracilis essentially lies on top of the soft tissues in the face. In other words, it does present a bulky uh, uh, prominence in the cheek. And then this bulkiness is accentuated many times with uh, activation or smile production. Not always the case, but again, most patients seem to have this problem. The uh, predictability of the smile is also uh, difficult to do when you're talking about the gracilis. In other words, there's no way to test this muscle at the time of the surgery in order to understand that we have adequate mobility of this uh, of the corner of the mouth. Um, whereas in the temporalis, uh, procedure, the nerve and blood vessels are left connected and simply the muscle is reoriented and moved, which allows us to stimulate that muscle during surgery to see how much movement we're achieving. The onset of the smile is also quite drastically different. We almost immediately see smiling happening in the temporalis group, whereas the gracilis group, whether you're doing a one-stage or a two-stage surgery, can take anywhere between three to 12 months to, perform, uh, to produce a smile. And when we talk again about the aesthetics of, of the reconstruction, we want to know, do, where do we create this nasal labial fold? This is a very prominent fold that uh, everyone usually has when they go to smile. It's the crease between the lip, lip and the cheek. And this is more accurately predicted in the temporalis uh, because we, we can visualize the exact spot where we put this tendon and we can test it during surgery. Whereas with, in the gracilis option, this is highly unpredictable. Uh, and it's, it basically is a uh, uh, almost a guesswork as to where that fold will occur or where that dimple in the cheek will happen uh, when, the, when the smile is activated. So when we... Backtrack now and look at the uh, two-stage reconstruction option. Uh, we need to talk about the cross-face nerve graft. So what is this? There's a nerve that lies in the back of the uh, lower leg, and this is called the sural nerve. It's a long nerve that goes all the way from the uh, crease of the knee all the way to the outer aspect of the foot and gives approximately a quarter size patch of, of uh, sensation to that part of uh, the foot. Uh, thankfully, this is not a critical patch of sensation that is required. So we can harvest this very long nerve uh, through very small incisions in the lower leg and uh, transplant this in the face. And when it, when it, uh, it looks like in the face, underneath the skin, when the uh, nerve is tunneled from the normal side, which it, where it is spliced into a branch of the facial nerve that is activating the smile on the normal side. And then this is then uh, uh, passed underneath a uh, skin, underneath the skin towards the paralyzed side, and it's banked in the upper lip for a period of, of anywhere between uh, six to 12 months in order for re to slowly migrate down that channel. And uh, of course, when, when, we're, when the uh, uh, re innervation occurs, the muscle transplant or the gracilis muscle can then be moved into place. So <clears throat> what is the one-stage option for uh, gracilis reconstruction? Well, we need to find the masseter nerve. It's a very tiny nerve, and it's, again, there's two branches of this nerve that exist from the base of the skull and deep in the face, right behind the masseter muscle itself. So the nerve then sprouts into the backside of the muscle and gives it a large amount of power to clench down tightly uh, with jaw closure. Well, because of its dual innervation, we can borrow one of those nerves and plug it directly into our uh, 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 gracilis muscle in order to get that muscle functioning. So moving on to some patient examples, 
uh, will demonstrate some of these concepts. So a nerve transfer, this is a 16-year-old boy with early form of facial paralysis, and that resulted from a tumor excision on the uh, side of the scalp. He had a masseter to facial nerve transfer, as I described previously. And in approximately two years from the time of the transfer, we're seeing a greater deal of not only eye closure, but a, very more, a much more prominent nasolabial fold creation, and even a lower lip depressor activity, which was, which was absent uh, uh, at the time of the initial diagnosis, as you can see on the left. <coughs> now, if we get into the late phase, now we're talking about uh, a more permanent type of reconstruction, and again, we divide the reconstruction into thirds of the face. Here we see a, a young boy, seven years old, hit by a car, has complete paralysis of one of the branches, which, uh, which gives uh, functionality to the brow muscle here, or the frontalis muscle, to help elevate the eyebrow. As you can see, his eyebrow has fallen, and it's given a extra weight to the upper eyelid, and this has resulted in uh, ptosis of not only the brow, but of the upper eyelid itself. So for this young boy, we perform what's called a brow pexy or an elevation of the brow through a previous scar that he had in the eyebrow region. And we essentially excise the ellipse of skin and anchor the soft tissues higher up so that it opens the eye better. And here we are at one week post-op and again at one year post-op, the results are sustained throughout. In the middle third, uh, we like to, uh, again, in my practice, I like to perform placement of an eyelid weight or a levator lengthening of the upper eyelid uh, uh, in addition to a lower eyelid tendon sling. In this uh, particular case, this is a 16-year-old girl who had facial paralysis as a result of a brain tumor excision. Um, she uh, had upper and lower eyelid dysfunction as it is common with facial paralysis. The upper eyelid uh, had a platinum weight inserted, and the lower eyelid uh, had the tendon sling performed. And here we are at nine months post-op, and we see that not only is the position excellent and symmetric at uh, nine months from the time of surgery uh, of just the open eye, but when she goes to close the eye, we see a more complete closure of the upper eyelid and a no longer a reliance on um, on uh, eye lubricants to keep the eye moist. Switching gears, now we're talking about the lower third of the face to reanimate the smile. Uh, this is a case of a 45-year-old uh, uh, lady with facial paralysis related to Bell's palsy, uh, which never recovered. And uh, she came in uh, wanting the fewest number of operations to get her smiling and symmetric again. So in this particular patient, we performed a gracilis muscle to masseter nerve innervation, and uh, simultaneously we, perform, we performed a, uh, a muscle resection or an excision of the lower lip depressors on the normal side to help balance the lower lip. And so what we see here at a year and a half postoperatively is an excellent mouth symmetry. Now one thing I will point out is that there is a slight amount of bulkiness to the cheek here uh, which can result, uh, as I mentioned previously. In, uh, in this is a, another case of a gracilis muscle transfer. This is one is a five-year-old girl with Mobius syndrome. Again, this is a congenital condition where the uh, seventh cranial nerve is absent and never developed uh, in the womb. Uh, in this case, we do a one-stage gracilis transfer from the thigh into the cheek and uh, we stage that with a second surgery to the, do the opposite side. And again, we connect that to the masseter nerve on the same side so that when she does go to bite, she's able to trigger a smile. Once again, we're seeing a, a prominence when she goes to bite or a cheekiness when, when the uh, bulging occurs. And of course, this is also slightly present when she's at rest. And, and we use a very tiny piece of muscle in this case, and it still ended up becoming bulky. Here's another example of a facial nerve uh, re, uh, or a facial reanimation or a little smile reanimation in a two-stage fashion this time. And we initially started off with a cross-face nerve graft. Again, we plugged into the 
non-paralyzed side with a sural nerve obtained from the leg and tunneled this un under the upper lip and banked it in, in the upper lip on the opposite side. After about one year, uh, she demonstrated good innervation through that uh, particular nerve channel and was ready for the actual gracilis muscle transfer. And again, we took the, uh, the muscle from the thigh and plugged it into the blood vessels and the nerves uh, and the cross face nerve graft on the side uh, of the, uh, on the paralyzed side in order to uh, reanimate the smile. And here she is two years post-op demonstrating excellent symmetry of the lip, uh, lips. Again, we performed a debulking of the lower lip on this side and excision of the lower lip muscles in order to balance that lower lip better. And uh, switching gears again, we're going to show some examples of the temporalis muscle. And this has become a workhorse in my practice because of the various advantages that are present with it. Uh, this is a case of a nine-year-old girl with facial paralysis. And you can see the attendant problems that you do typically see with uh, uh, facial paralysis. The lower eyelid is lagging. The upper eyelid fails to close. And they, there is a, a negative vector on the... Uh, paralyzed side of the lips. In other words, when she tries to smile, everything moves over and shifts over to the uh, uh, normal side, including the base of the nose. And when we uh, perform the temporalis, we see that she has done very well. She's still learning to control the smile and she's demonstrating excellent contraction at, at very uh, soon after surgery, which is about, this is shown at approximately six months. Now, here's another case of a temporalis transfer, a 10-year-old girl with facial paralysis, and she also underwent the temporalis procedure on, uh, and a lower lip depressor muscle excision on the opposite normal side, and we see her uh, here demonstrating a very good smile at even four weeks, and she developed an amazing amount of spontaneity of her smile. And she still uh, struggles with some speech, but she is, has an excellent control and an excellent symmetric nasolabial fold production. Even one year post-op, we see the results are sustained. And she's demonstrating she can independently contract. She still has some problems with the various functions, but again, these are improving year by year. And we're going to, I'm going to demonstrate what, how this looks in a child with Mobius syndrome. Here's a, a nine-year-old with paralysis of both sides of the face uh, in relation to Mobius syndrome. And we performed a bilateral or two-sided uh, surgery to move both temporalis muscles into position into the corners of the mouth and to, in order to reanimate the smile. And uh, this is his results at uh, 10 months following surgery, and he's now able to contract the smile under a fairly good control. You see him actively biting currently, and again, this is very early on, uh, and the uh, uh, the process is not complete at this point in terms of relearning and repurposing that muscle, which it will become uh, over time. And this is actually a very nice uh, feature of the brain in a child specifically, but we're seeing this more often in adults as well as uh, these days, where muscles that are innervated by the masseter nerve or the biting nerve is, is retrainable and becomes spontaneous over time. Now, this doesn't happen in everyone, but it happens in a, a large majority of patients. So just to summarize uh, the talk here today, facial paralysis needs to be divided into early and late periods. This is a very critical distinction to know. So if it's under 12 months, we call that early. Over 12 months is late. Multiple treatment options are available. As you, you saw here, it depends again on the timing of the paralysis. Nerve transfers become more successful if it's early on and suspected that there is no progression of nerve functionality. Uh, and muscle transfers can come into play as a uh, solution to more permanent paralysis. Again, dynamic options, whenever possible, are preferable to static options. Um, 
in my practice, I do not perform the static sling in the corner of the mouth because I simply do not like the appearance. Um, I uh, opt for dynamic options when those are uh, the, uh, those, when those are indicated and produce the most optimal results. The, the bottom line, again, is to see a qualified and an experienced specifically a facial paralysis surgeon. These typically tend to be plastic surgeons, uh, and the origin of these types of surgeries are from plastic surgeons uh, historically. And again, you want to see this type of surgeon early in life uh, or early in the um, uh, period of uh, the facial paralysis. You do not want to uh, wait on this uh, in, in order to avoid a permanent situation. I want to thank you all for watching. Uh, you can get more information at uh, www.drpanosian.com. And please stay tuned for my new website uh, for the launch of uh, the Facial Paralysis Center. And the URL is facialparalysiscenter.com. Excellent. So now we will switch gears and see if there's any questions um, for... Uh, Okay, let's see here. All right. So we have a question regarding uh, Mobius syndrome and the presence of other conditions uh, that can potentially get in the way. So uh, if there's a heart problem, for example, then we need to stratify that risk with the um, importance of reconstructing for facial paralysis. Of course, this needs to be uh, taken into account with a uh, cardiologist in place who can uh, understand and um, uh, give us an opinion whether surgery is safe at all. The surgery, uh, thankfully, is, has shortened uh, with my technique of using the temporalis muscle uh, and sometimes we can even do both sides simultaneously so that from that standpoint it's actually a very uh, nice way to go uh, and also decreases the length of time under anesthesia which is the key factor involved with uh, knowing when uh, surgery will be safe for this type of uh, procedure that's a great question Another uh, uh, individual asks, uh, how, what is the incidence of uh, Mobius syndrome uh, in the population? Well, uh, Mobius syndrome is a very rare condition. It basically, uh, ha it, it, the rarity of it, it makes it somewhat difficult to follow, but somewhere between 1 in 50,000 and 1 in 500,000 was somewhere in in the, on the average of one in 200,000 uh, being born every year with Mobius syndrome. So that's a good question. It's still a very rare condition, but a very uh, devastating condition to many families uh, nonetheless. 
Okay, another question from Boston here. Okay, so uh, question is, when uh, is Bell's palsy, uh, oh, I'm sorry, when, when do you intervene for Bell's palsy? Okay, well, Bell's palsy, as I mentioned, you need to get to a facial paralysis surgeon early on. And the importance of that is highlighted and underscored uh, by the trend that is happening. You do not want the Bell's palsy to become permanent. Of course, you want the nerve to recover on its own when it can. So we use the steroids early on, antivirals, for approximately four to six weeks in order to see progress, sometimes even as far as two months. If there is a failure to progress, and again, we're watching every month, <coughs> but we see a complete plateauing of the effect by somewhere around three to six months. And again, this is case by case and needs to be evaluated by the surgeon. Then the decision can be to move on to something such as a uh, uh, nerve transfer. So a very good question. Okay, a question from Chicago. Uh, I have synkinesis. Uh, can you tell me more about what that is and how that can be treated? Okay, well, synchinesis is uh, something that, that I did not touch on, but uh, basically synchinesis can happen anytime when there's facial nerve paralysis and the facial nerve regeneration process results in a uh, cross innervation occurring through its many redundant branches further out into the face. So uh, what that means is that the... Uh, Facial nerve uh, will then trigger, for example, when you smile to cause blinking or closure of the eye. And that's a, this can be quite debilitating for a lot of people. So when uh, someone goes to smile or close their eyes, then the smile might go up or the eye may shut. And it's a very uh, disconcerting problem. In many cases, therapy can help. Uh, facial paralysis rehab specialist uh, is, is a uh, key person in all of these types of procedures, but also in the rehabilitation of Bell's palsy. In addition, uh, the uh, steroids uh, in the beginning can be helpful, but not so much in longstanding Bell's palsy, which has failed to recover all the way and now has a synkinesis component to it. Synchinesis can be broken up, though, surgically by uh, essentially going in and finding that cross innervation pattern in, and physically damaging it so that that does not occur. Does this always work? No. Uh, sometimes it takes several attempts to have that uh, work. The other way that we can control synchinesis is through Botox, a very targeted denervation, we call this, whereby we inject the uh, problematic areas with Botox to help uh, uh, stop the um, uh, rapid fire movement of the unwanted muscle. So in other words, if you're trying to smile and you're closing your eyes and you might want to Botox the air region around the eyes slightly to help uh, limit that activity from uh, overtaking the uh, process of smiling. Again, this, that's a non-permanent process and may need to be repeated uh, over the course of a lifetime sometimes. All right, moving on. Take uh, another question here. And uh, this is from uh, Laura up in uh, Wisconsin. And she asks, uh, all right. She asks, uh, what uh, type of hemifacial microsomia, I'm sorry, what is the incidence of hemifacial microsomia that can result in facial paralysis? Well, hemifacial microsomia, as I mentioned previously, has is actually a more common problem than something like Mobius syndrome. Not as common as Bell's palsy, but uh, it's fairly common as a congenital cause of facial palsy. But even then, the actual problem related to non-development of the facial nerve or incomplete development of that facial nerve is a very rare problem within hemifacial microsomia. So the incidence is approximately 20% uh, uh, or 20 to 25% of hemifacial microsomia patients will de demonstrate some 
aspect of facial nerve paralysis or weakness. Okay, so we have some interest in the temporalis procedure, and uh, I will, can talk about more about that. So the uh, temporalis procedure, it has uh, been a novel technique that I have developed um, over the last 10 years or so. And it's essentially several significant modifications of a very old concept, as I had alluded to. Um, the muscle itself uh, is, again, used for biting, and it's a valuable muscle because it's actually sitting in the right place. And the value of this muscle is that it, uh, the value of this type of surgery, I will say, is, is several, is, is many different aspects to it are, are uh, uh, make it so much more favorable than the gracilis option, in my opinion the temporalis pr procedure can be very short. Uh, it can last anywhere between three to four and a half hours. It's now a same day surgery or an outpatient surgery that it can be, uh, that can be performed. Um, uh, the uh, bulkiness of the cheek is not an issue anymore. The time to reanimation is much improved. And th this is evident right out of the gates. Um, uh, therapy is still required in order to make the muscle work uh, or make the muscle spontaneous, I should say, but this is not a debilitating reason to not want to do the, the, this type of surgery. Uh, now, there is a certain revision rate that we need to talk about. Every surgery, all of these surgeries ha can need to be revised. We're talking about dynamic symmetry. This is a very complicated issue. Um, for example, when you do uh, a rhinoplasty or a nose job, for example, the nose doesn't go anywhere. Uh, the nose structure is changed internally, and essentially what you see is what you get. Whereas in facial reanimation, when someone is not smiling or the face is at rest, this is simply, uh, this is not a really a big issue. But when the muscle activates to give a smile, for example, then that symmetry can be off. And it really needs to, there need, really needs to be a procedure that can be revised very easily, and the temporalis is just that procedure in my hands. And so um, in a small percentage of case, cases, we do need to go back and simply uh, do a one or two hour revision, uh, which is also an outpatient procedure to help mobilize the muscle or improve the symmetry of the smile. Um, uh, the, uh, there, other advantages, as I had mentioned previously, in that you, you get to fine tune this muscle right there during the surgery. This is a very important feature, in my opinion, uh, as to the success of facial reanimation. If you cannot know how this muscle will move later, uh, it's almost a lost opportunity. So the temporalis procedure allows me to stimulate that muscle, see how it moves, and adjust as necessary before we leave the operating room. So very good questions. All right, and uh, I think those conclude the questions. Um, all right, I can be available for further questions if you like at uh, www.drpanossian.com or uh, stay tuned for my new website, as I discussed, at www.facialparalysiscenter.com. Thank you for watching, and I hope you can uh, review this on YouTube at uh, your leisure. Uh, check out Dr. Panosian's YouTube channel uh, for further details on that. Thanks again, and good night.